going to uh, be reading from Ruth chapter 4 this morning. Uh, We come now to the conclusion of our brief uh, Advent series in the book of Ruth. And uh, we're going to be reading and uh, reflecting on Ruth chapter 4 verses 13 and following. Hear the word of God and receive it with a believing heart. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. There ends the reading of God's word, and may he add his blessing to it as we reflect on it this morning. Uh, But let's uh, bow our heads and uh, go before the Lord in a time of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you on this morning and we give you thanks for all that you are to us, all that you are in yourself and all that you have done for us. We give you thanks, the Lord, uh, particularly on this morning for the incarnation of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for the fact that you in eternal love have sought us. Uh, You have come looking for us alienated as we were by nature from you. And you have sent your son to bear our sins. We give you thanks, O Lord, our God, for the mystery of the incarnation. For this uh, mystery, how it is that the eternal son of God has taken to himself human flesh. And uh, we ask, O Lord, our God, that you would cause our hearts to rejoice today. Uh, We anticipate, many of us anyway, celebrating with friends and family today. We anticipate uh, a day of, of fellowship, a day of food, a day of games, perhaps. But let us not lose sight of uh, what it is that we are celebrating. And may this ultimately be the height of our celebration that you, O Lord our God, are with us in Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, we pray that you would be with uh, those uh, today who, uh, rather than celebrating our mourning, we think particularly of our sister Michelle uh, Rose and uh, her family as they are mourning the loss of her Aunt Lois. Uh, Lord, to be bereaved uh, Uh, at this time of year of of any time is uh, very difficult indeed, but we ask that you would be, uh, reveal yourself as the God of all mercies to Michelle and to her family today. We ask that you would be with those, O Lord, who uh, are lonely and anticipate loneliness today, those uh, who are mourning, those uh, who for various uh, reasons are downcast. And we ask, Lord, that the message of the incarnation would bring comfort and joy even to those who are bowed down with grief. Be with us, we pray, now as we turn to meditate upon your word. We ask that you would open our eyes, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit from your word. Be with your servant that he may speak your word faithfully and clearly for the glory of your name. And we ask, O Lord our God, that you would help us to see our own story in the story that we are concluding today and uh, to give you thanks and to be filled with with praise for you, our God. For we ask all of these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.
uh, friends, uh, brothers and sisters, stories have a power over us, don't they? Uh, even those of us uh, who may not like to read, we still like to hear stories, we still like to be told stories, and uh, we're all storytellers in our own way. Each one of us is telling a story about our lives. Uh, each one of us tells a story about who God is and how God works. Uh, it's interesting when we think about stories to contrast the, the uh, story that we find in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation uh, with our contemporary stories. Uh, happy endings have become passe in the 21st century. And uh, now, rather than uh, a happy ending, many uh, stories that are being written uh, have uh, something of a, a jaded feeling to them. Uh, the, the, the character, the lead characters, uh, maybe they realize that, uh, in fact, uh, life is, is futile and there's really not that much meaning uh, in life at all. That's a very common ending to stories now. Whereas in an earlier time, uh, stories uh, almost always had a happy ending. There was a, a resolution. There was a completeness to the story. Uh, and, and that's uh, certainly the case with Ruth, right? We've, we've been building, and actually the darkest part of the story is at the beginning. And uh, now in uh, the few verses that we've read from Ruth chapter 4, we've come full circle, and we've come to the end of the story, and it ends on a particularly high note. Uh, but as I've uh, argued uh, over the last several weeks, what we see in the book of Ruth is really a portrait of the gospel in miniature. And uh, in that way, then, uh, what uh, we are invited to do as we read the book of Ruth is not simply to reflect upon a romantic story or a, a, a happy a little story that happened to a handful of characters in Bethlehem some 3,200 years ago. Uh, that would uh, perhaps be helpful, that would perhaps be profitable, but the Spirit speaks to us concerning our own stories from the story of Ruth this morning. And ultimately, it is not coincidence, uh, but the divine orchestration that leads to this story, which so closely resembles the gospel taking place in that town called Bethlehem. Uh, you notice perhaps in the bulletin that uh, our theme for today was to be salvation seen in Bethlehem. I wasn't feeling it. And uh, I, I decided that a better theme, I think, that captures the, the, uh, what we've read is the Bethlehem rewrite. The Bethlehem rewrite. And what we find is that uh, in these verses that we've read is that by his incarnation, Christ redeems our stories and he replaces our emptiness with his fullness. Uh, and, and we see this, I, I believe, successively in three different people's stories. Uh, we're going to consider this truth as it comes to expression in Ruth's story. Secondly, in Naomi's story, and thirdly, in Boaz's story. But uh, as we consider the Bethlehem rewrite of Ruth's story, we come to conclude uh, this uh, fact that applies to us all. God is with us. And we see this uh, in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Here we have uh, at least nine months of history collapsed into roughly 20 words or so. Uh, but what a nine months of history. Here we find uh, what uh, we might be uh, apt to pass over as uh, simply the ordinary course of marriage. After all, this is what happens in marriage, right? A man takes his wife. He takes her to his home, and uh, God willing, that union is blessed in time with a child, very ordinary. And yet, is it? Uh, certainly for Ruth, that was not the case. 
Because Ruth's story was a story that was filled with pain. But Ruth's story, uh, even more than simply being filled with the pain of loss, as she, after all, was a widow, uh, let us remember it was uh, a story that was characterized by the pain of barrenness. Because God had not blessed Ruth's marriage to Naomi's son, Malon, with a child. But neither uh, Ruth nor or Orpah became pregnant. Neither of them had children. And so it was that not only Naomi was barren, but also these daughters-in-law were barren. But Ruth's story was marked also uh, by uh, at least something that she wouldn't have sensed early in her life, uh, which was alienation from God himself. Because she came from the wrong side of the tracks, right? She grew up in Moab. And, and what is a girl uh, that uh, uh, grows up in Moab? What does she have to hope for? She doesn't have anything to hope for eternally. She doesn't have anything to hope for uh, spiritually. Uh, the best that she can hope for is a happy family life. And that also was taken from her. But now in verse 13. We find that the God who specializes in doing what we consider to be impossible, the God who is all wise and works all things according to his plan, works in time and in space through the ordinary actions of faithful people to bring transformation to Ruth's life. First, he draws her to Bethlehem as she follows her mother-in-law, Naomi. Then he providentially arranges for her to meet this man, Boaz, who just happens to be a kinsman redeemer for her family in the field of Moab, or in the field of Bethlehem, rather. And now, against all odds, this woman who was once a foreigner and an outcast has been given a place and a name and a standing as an Israelite indeed, as the wife of Boaz. And the Lord... Uh, we read explicitly, the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. Uh, by the way, I think it's worth noting in our age of scientism that it is still true that every child that is conceived is a child that is conceived by the Lord's power. Uh, this is not sim simply something that we explain away by a scientific uh, process of reproduction. But this is the reality that is working behind something we consider to be very ordinary. That God grants conception. But consider, consider how Boaz's act of drawing Ruth into his home and into his daily life, drawing her into the closest possible relationship with himself is analogous to what Christ has done for us. You know, isn't it, isn't it wonderful and isn't it interesting? This is, after all, what we're celebrating today. That, that God, in his love and in his mercy, does not work out for us an, a salvation that is simply in the abstract. Nor is it, it, is, nor is it something that is uh, distant. It's not impersonal. The, the salvation which the Lord our God has provided for us, the salvation which he reveals in his word, the salvation which is revealed in Bethlehem in the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ is an emphatically personal kind of redemption. It's not a, a governmental incentive uh, to, to cut you a check. It's not the reformation of this structure or that structure in order to make your life better or to restore some kind of justice to your life. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not a process of, of counseling simply by which you come to a place of self-realization and self-actualization and, and you accept your life for the way that it is or whatever it may be. But that the Lord, our God, as He brings salvation he does so in a most personal kind of way he takes our humanity into his godhead and seals this truth forevermore god with us you know what i suspect that 
if Ruth was a thinking woman, and I have no doubt to believe, or no reason to believe she wasn't a thinking woman, that perhaps she was given to wonder at times what the incentive was for casting in her lot with Naomi and with Naomi's God. For after all, by Naomi's own declaration, God had gone out against her. That was her reading of her story. We'll get there in a minute. But uh, perhaps Ruth was inclined to wonder as well, uh, was God interested in her personally? Was God actually, uh, did, did God see the pattern of her life? Uh, was God for her? Was God uh, against her? Was God with her? Was God absent from her? And yet we see in the, uh, the, 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 the pinnacle of her story, God was with Ruth. And God is with you, dear child of God. That's the message of the incarnation that we celebrate today. It's a beautiful thing, though, played out in the life of Ruth. Uh, she who was once a, a foreigner and a widow is now uh, brought into Israel and she's uh, given a name and she's given a home and she's given a husband and she's given a child, and I suspect there were several more children that came in due time. Uh, and, and it illustrates so powerfully what it is that we read of the Lord Jesus' ministry to us in Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. That was what, Naomi, or what Ruth experienced in her life, and that is the truth that God speaks to us today that he marries himself to us, right? Because that's, that's what Paul says in Ephesians 5, that the, the, the relationship w between Christ and his church is so close, the, it must be described in terms of the most intimate relationship known to mankind, that between a husband and a wife. As we sing, from heaven he came and sought her to be his, perf his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her. And for her life, he died. That's the love that Ruth experienced through Boaz and ultimately through the Lord God. And that is the love that we experience through Jesus Christ. Because the incarnation is not simply a means to an end. There can be a kind of pragmatism about that, can't there? Uh, we, we can become kind of pragmatic. Well, Jesus had to come in the flesh and he had to come in the flesh in order to die for our sins. But the incarnation is more than that because the incarnation actually embodies God's purpose in redemption. It's not just that God has sent his son to redeem us, to save us, but he redeems us by making his dwelling with us and preparing us by his spirit to dwell with God in glory forever. This is the truth embodied in his name, Emmanuel. This is the truth of the Shekinah glory of which we read in, in Luke chapter 2 and the glory of the Lord shone around them. It was a visible message to the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem. Uh, but I, I believe that I would be remiss if I also uh, didn't challenge us with this question. We admire Ruth. Uh, we really look up to Ruth. We think she's a pretty great gal. And uh, we, we love to talk about her story and what it is that God did in her life. But I wonder, do we like Boaz and like the Lord our God, welcome unredeemed, quote unquote, outcasts? Do we show the kind of Christ-like love to people who aren't part of us? like Boaz showed to Ruth in his field. Ultimately, Boaz acting in that way, he simply reflects the love of God. And that is the same calling that we have to embody the truth to those coming in those doors. God is with us. But secondly, uh, in the Bethlehem rewrite, we consider the way in which God rewrites Naomi's story. And uh, Naomi's story, I think, embodies this truth. 
If Ruth embodies the truth that God is with us, Naomi embodies the truth God is for us. God is for us. Now, Boaz and Ruth, as uh, we've noted in past weeks, they're, they're really the central actors in the, the whole story of Ruth. And yet, it's not really Boaz and Ruth's story so much as it is Naomi's story. The book of Ruth is really the story of Naomi's redemption. And we see this very clearly in verses uh, 14 through 17. As those same women, likely, that gathered around Naomi when she was entering into Bethlehem uh, some several months before this point, and and commiserating with her, if you will, listening to her, um, mourning with her the loss that she's experienced, they now happen to be present at the birth of this child. And they now rejoice with her, and they rejoice in the Lord's redeeming grace in her life. Uh, This story is a story that began with Naomi's emptying, Uh, by her own account anyway, right? She had gone out full. She said that at the end of chapter 1, I I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. It's a story that began with her emptying. First she lost her husband, then she lost her son's. And along with her husband and her sons, she lost all hope for her material future. She lost her means of sustenance. She lost her means of physical protection. But she also lost uh, the the propagation of her, uh, her husband's name throughout generations to come. And she had lost... The, uh, the land that was deeded to her husband, the, the, that which was her husband's inheritance. She had lost so much. And yet we see now in the end of this story that the Lord actually fills her more full than she ever was from the beginning. Because she's spiritually full, first of all. We've been following her transition, her transition from, uh, from bitterness and sorrow to hope, uh, now to, to uh, her hope being realized in uh, Boaz's redemption of the land, and now even more fully by the blessing that the Lord has given upon the marriage of Boaz and Ruth in this child, Obed. And it is not without significance. Look at the way that the, the women of the town refer to Obed uh, in terms uh, or re- relative to Naomi. Verse 17 the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And as they, see, as they see it, Naomi not only has a son, but Naomi now has a future. She has someone, a family member, who will take care of her. Of course, uh, we would expect that Boaz uh, would, uh, being the kind of guy that Boaz is in particular, he would uh, definitely Uh, be willing to provide for her. But now God has really renewed her family line through this child, Obed. And and what we've seen in the course of this story, although in subtle ways, ways that have to be teased out, is is the way in which God has worked to uh, reverse the natural trajectory of Naomi's story. I mean, think about it. She and her family left Bethlehem, They left the land of promise and they went and sojourned and eventually just permanently decamped to the fields of Moab. She was apostate to some extent. She was one who was deeply backslidden. Being away from, uh, uh, away from the land, being away from the tabernacle, she was, in a very real sense, far removed from God in, in some way. And yet God has worked in difficult ways, admittedly. Painful ways, definitely. To draw her back. But bringing her back He restores to her family a place and a name, a future and a hope. She's no longer barren. She's no longer uncovered. God has given to her a son, Obed, 
uh, literally servant, and a daughter-in-law who, uh, as the women of the town say, is better than seven sons. This is kind of the ideal in the Israelite mind. Uh, seven sons is the ultimate blessing. And yet they say, this, this woman, Ruth, there's something very special about her. She's better to you than seven sons. God has transformed not only her material circumstances, but also her emotional circumstances and her spiritual circumstances. Some of you are sitting here today, I suspect. And uh, while you, you might conclude that Naomi's loss is more extreme than whatever loss you've suffered, you find yourself in a place of pain and barrenness. Maybe it's uh, you, you have prodigals in your family. Uh, maybe you're married to a prodigal. Maybe there, there is some other situation in your life that causes you daily pain. It causes you some kind of daily uh, suffering. And, and, and perhaps you wonder in the depth of your heart, as Naomi actually gave voice for uh, to, is, is God for me? Is God really for me? In fact, she had gone further than that point, and she had said, God has turned against me. His hand is against me. I, I, I'm under a dark cloud. You don't want to be anywhere near me because the Lord has turned against me. He is my enemy. He is not my friend. Well, my dear friend, if that describes your situation this morning, take heart. Because first of all, in the story of Naomi, we discover the way in which God works. That he works in dark providences, that he works through painful situations, that he works in spite of the odds, that he brings about things that are most surprising, most unexpected to transform each one of our stories. For those who rest in him, and in his son. But if you doubt, if you doubt that Naomi's outcome may be your own, look again some 1,200 years later to another babe in Bethlehem. Because there the Lord adds his yes and amen to what we see visibly manifest in the life of Naomi. In sending his son, ultimately the foundation of Naomi's redemption, ultimately the foundation of Ruth's redemption, and ultimately the foundation of our redemption. God is working. And he is for you. That is the message of the incarnation. God is with us. God is for us. You know, it's, it's trendy to be jaded in the information age. There's some young people here this morning, I think, that you, you think you know so much. I'm going to insult you a little bit, and I'm going to tell you you don't know nearly so much as you think you do, number one. And 20 years, should God give you those years, are going to reveal to you a lot of things that you don't, understand it all okay number one but number two this jadedness arises from this massive access to information which was just basically unheard of to your grandparents generation your great-grandparents and, and and that information it's an information overload and it's an, a lot of its information that's concerning and it causes some kind of anxiety in your lives and it's information that leads you to be jaded because you see the inner workings. You see, you, you distrust everybody. You distrust the system. You distrust the man. And you feel like you're just a part of the machinery. But you need to understand this. There is a great deal more to life than what you see. And than what you will ever see in your lifetime. God is working in ways that you cannot fathom, in ways that you cannot understand. He's working even in spite of your skepticism. And I can tell you this, you, can, you walk down the road of skepticism, and that road of skepticism is going to take you nowhere fast. But you rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. You rely on God's salvation revealed from heaven, and you will never be 
dissatisfied. You will never be disappointed. God will never let you down. Because if he is willing to send his only begotten son, there is nothing for your good that he will withhold from you. And that is a fact that comes with the imprimatur, the authority of Scripture. What you need is a new set of eyeglasses. The eyeglasses of the Holy Spirit. Because he's going to show you a different story. And that's the message of Christmas. God is for us. But then thirdly and finally, we see the, the rewrite of Boaz's story. And if, if uh, Ruth illustrates for us the fact that God is with us, it, Naomi illustrates for us the fact that God is for us, Boaz illustrates for, uh, for us the fact that God is working for our salvation. He is working for our salvation. And we see this in uh, verses uh, 18 through 22. To this point uh, in Ruth's story, the focus has been upon one family. The perspective has been very, very narrow. But now we see in these final verses of Ruth that this family is part of a much larger story. A story that concerns ultimately the tribe of Judah. But even greater than that, it concerns the nation of Israel. A fact uh, which, by the way, is, is hinted at um, in verse 14. Uh, as uh, these women pray that Obed may become famous throughout Israel. Uh, their prayer for, for Boaz is that he would be famous among uh, Judah, basically. Their prayer for Obed is that he would be famous among Israel. We see that there's this, this widening scope, this widening view of the family's history. But as we read the Bible, it becomes clear that uh, this concerns uh, Ruth's story, Naomi's story, Boaz's story, concerns actually all the nations under heaven. Uh, because we see God working actually to fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham uh, in Genesis chapter 22. And in you or in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so we, we see this illustrious family line. Uh, ten generations here. I want to, to point out that I do not believe that uh, this is what you would call an exhaustive genealogy. Uh, this is a genealogy that has a theological message. So there are some missing generations, okay? Um, but the, there's missing generations uh, because they want to drive home uh, the significance of certain figures in this line. Uh, so in verse 20, we, we read of this man, Nashon. And Nashon was, he's the fifth in the line, a significant position numerically. Now, if you were to turn back earlier in the Old Testament, you were to read the story of the Exodus, you would learn that Nashon was actually the prince of Judah. He was the leader of the tribe of Judah. He, he was the one uh, that led the people of Judah throughout the sojourn in the wilderness. He was also the one who presented the offering on behalf of Judah for the tabernacle. And he, he is the first one listed. He is a man that was honored. He was a man that uh, possessed a certain kind of power. And in him was, was uh, we could say, say, vaguely prophesied or prefigured somebody very significant that was to come of this family line. But now moving down to spaces, we come to an even more significant position, number seven in this uh, line of ten generations, and that just happens to be given to our friend Boaz. Now, as I mentioned last week, it is fascinating to notice that while Boaz's gift to the family of Elimelech was to raise a child uh, or to father a child to carry on the family name of Elimelech, Elimelech just kind of fades from the story here because the Spirit chooses to give honor to Boaz as a man who is faithful to God. And so it is Boaz 
that appears as the father of Obed here, which of course literally he is, but adoptively he was, it was supposed to be Elimelech. But it is also Boaz whose name shows up in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy of none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now this uh, genealogy culminates with this man David in the 10th place, the most uh, illustrious place of all. And, and as I noted before, it seems that the book of Ruth was actually written during the reign of David, uh, some 150-ish years after the events took place. And it was uh, a, a story that seemed to uh, bolster the reputation of David, the second king that had been chosen by God, right? Some viewed him as a usurper. Some viewed him as uh, a, a one who had overthrown the rightful line of Saul rather than viewing him as the anointed of God. And so this book, in this sense, is an apologetic of this. It, it, it draws us back into David's family line to consider David's family history and the way in which God was providentially working in order to bring David onto the scene. But to understand this more fully, we need to understand again the context of the book of Ruth. For the book of Ruth happens during the time of the Judges. And remember, the refrain in the book of Judges is what? There was no king in the land, and everyone did what was right in his own sight. This was the fundamental problem of God's people during the time of the judges. By the way, this is the, the fundamental problem with which we continue to struggle. Because uh, functionally, we are anarchists. By nature, we are anarchists. Uh, there is no king in the land, and everybody wants to do what's right in his own eyes. Uh, we're, we, we are radically libertarian in our understanding uh, at, at the heart level. We need a king. Israel needed a king. And you see, God worked in Boaz's life, and he worked in a way that was beyond imagining in Boaz's story placing Boaz directly into the line of the king who would come to solve Israel's problem. But the king really didn't solve Israel's problem, did he? He was a good king. He was a godly man. But he was a sinner. And so what, what happens at the end of the book of Ruth is it leaves us hanging because David's great, but we need one who's better. And that brings us back to Bethlehem. 1,200 years later. Because there a king is born. A king that's not like any other king. A king who is literally heaven sent. A king who is both God and man. A king who not only in his conception, but also in his life and in his death was wholly righteous. A king who is fit indeed to lead the people of God. You see, God was working in Naomi's life, Ruth's life, Boaz's life, not simply to secure their individual future, but to secure the future of the people of Israel and ultimately to secure the future of all his people from every tribe, tongue, and nation under heaven. That's the message of Ruth, and that's the message of the incarnation. God is still working today. Because in the incarnation of Christ, we have all of these things. We, we, we have all of these things secured for us. God is with us. God is for us. God is working for our salvation. And yet, as the author to the Hebrews says, we do not yet see all things placed under his feet. There is still yet a, a future day. And so I have to tell you that if you're celebrating today, and, and today, this, this Christmas is a, a time of, of uh, joy for you, hold that joy, appreciate that joy, give thanks to God for that joy, but know this, that it pales in comparison to the joy that God has prepared for those that love him. It pales in comparison to the joy of those who are in Jesus Christ, who are resting in Christ alone by faith, and who through faith partake of all of Christ's benefits and who ultimately partake of Christ's glory. On the other hand, for those of you who are saddened today, 
struggling today, sorrowing today. Hold on. Because the message of the incarnation is your life is much, much better than you think it is. God has prepared for you a hope and a future. Hold on to him regardless of how dark it is. Even if all the stars go out and you can't see a thing, cling to the Lord your God because he will not disappoint you. That is what we are celebrating today. Because by his incarnation, Christ redeems our stories and he replaces our emptiness with his fullness. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, we glory in your wisdom and your power this morning. Lord, uh, you, your ways are beyond our ways. Your ways are above our ways. Your ways are indeed incomprehensible to us. And yet we confess this morning as we've been reminded that you do all things well. We give you thanks for your love and your mercy, which you have so clearly revealed in Christ, your Son. We pray that you would cause all uh, here this morning who are leaning and resting upon Christ to be filled with joy. We pray, Lord, that you would continue, continue to draw those who are yet outside of Christ, who yet remain at a distance, that they too may find at the feet of Christ, at the foot of the cross, a hope and a future. We ask, Lord, that uh, you would apply these words then to our heart as you see fit, and we ask that you would be glorified through it. Amen.